Man, the peeps of OCC, how y'all doing? Yeah. OCC, how you doing? Yeah. Hey, I got to give some shout out to some people. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, man, for for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's really it's been an honor for me to be here. I, I, I need to give a shout out to people. I got to give a shout out to, to my adoptive son, Hayden Van Dorian. Yeah. That's my boy right there, man. Love Hayden. He's been going through a church now for over a year. He's helped with our ESL classes and, and he's helping with our youth. Uh, Chris is somewhere out there. Uh, also, I want to help. I, I, I want to give a shout out to Annette. This is Annette here and Sarah. Sarah, Annette, yeah. They're helping me with uh, ESL classes over there. Uh, man, I, I just, uh, I just very excited. I want to give a shout out to los dominicanos. I heard there's dominicanos here. Dominica, boricua, boricua, ni boricua. No, boricua people, yeah. Cool, man, I'm excited. East Coast, East Coast. Anybody from the East Coast? Yes. Yeah. Way. West Coast. Hey. That's right, man. Ah, oh, man. You see, they are the liberal ones. They are all this rowdy. <laughs> Excuse them. They are a different kind of animal. People from the Midwest, yeah. right here. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. I tell you, man, I love the Midwest. I love the Midwest, man. I never thought I was going to come here. God was going to bring me here in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I tell you, when I... When I uh, when I found out I was coming to the States, which is a crazy long story, I really thought I was going to be where all my Dominicanos are, you know, uh, Florida, Miami, Nueva York, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in New York with my Dominicanos and God, nah, nah, you're, you're going to Missouri. <laughs> what? <laughs> and here I am in uh, Missouri, and now I'm in Southern Missouri. Of all places, saying God is good, man, but it's all right. You know, I'm kind of the odd duck here in southern Missouri because people are like, hey, okay, who, what are you? <laughs> you look black, but you don't sound black. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm from, from the deep south, <laughs> like really south in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> So, man, I'm just excited to be here, man. I'm telling you. It's very honor, very humble to be with you all. It's, again, I don't take it lightly. I don't take it lightly to be able to come here and yap a little bit. Uh, but hopefully it's not going to be more, or much, so much more of my talking. It's going to be the Holy Spirit uh, speaking to us. As, uh, as I open the Word of God for us, I pray that... Uh, we are willing to let him speak and illuminate our hearts in a beautiful and mighty way today. I, I would like you to please stand. I know standing is a controversy nowadays. <laughs> Too soon? Oh, man. God, I just started. Just saying, just saying. Just saying, if there's something you ought to stand, it's for the Word of God. Because Jesus is in the house. All right? So if there's something you got to stand for, it's for the Word of God, man. All right? I don't, I don't care about the other stuff. I care about this more. This is the truth. The truth. Not a truth. The truth. I'm not preaching yet, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's read the word. It's found in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 to 11. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet... I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. 
Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light. And in such a person, there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates another believer is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go because the darkness has brought on blindness. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing before you, O oh God, a rock and a redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, as a kid, I always wanted to do that. My dad was a pastor, and you know when he said, people, you may be seated, you may stand up. People just did whatever he told them to do. I was like, man, that's so cool. It's like I have a remote control or something. Pretty cool. Last week, Aaron Wheeler, uh, who did a fantastic job, he explained to you a little bit about the differences between uh, the Apostle John's writings and the other apostles. John's gospel is not quite like Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, not because it's a different gospel, but because he presents Jesus in a different perspective. While the other Gospels present Jesus as the, as the Messiah or the new Adam, John wants to make sure, he just wants to really make sure that there is no doubt in you that Jesus is God incarnated dwelling among us. In the letters, John's writings are no cumulative theological treatises like those of Paul, but they are more like essays against heresies that were confusing the believers. Uh, they were confused about who Jesus really was, whether he was human or whether he was God or he, whether he just appeared like human. It's more like a memo from the headquarters of the gospel telling them exactly and clearly what is it like to be a Christian. For example, if you were to compare the apostles with the Marvel comics, Paul would be like Dr. Charles Xavier, <laughs> Dr. X. And, and any comics fans here? Yeah. Hey, you know, Paul, Paul will, will be so deep and complex that even at times he will get ahead of his readers even before you could challenge him or protest his logic. He will say, where sin increased, grace abounded even more. And before you say something else, he will be, the very next verse, he will say, what then should we say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. And you read this and you're like, he's reading my mind. <laughs> John, on the other hand, grabs one word and expands on it. And, and using it several times and beautifully twisting it and beautifully putting it for you to destroy your heresies. He is like the hawk of the apostles. <laughs> John be like, love, hate, light, dark. John destroys heresies. <laughs> John destroys Gnosticism. <laughs> That's John. That's John. Today we will sort of do uh, what John did. We, we, will, we will focus on key words like darkness and hate and light and love. And we will expand a little bit more on them. I have walked in darkness before. Now, but I mean by that, I'm not talking about spiritual darkness. I mean literally, I have walked in darkness before. Like pitch black darkness. Because we have power outages in the Dominican Republic. And uh, believe me, man, uh, it, it, that's what happens there. 
but you are from an other developed country. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure needed to sustain electricity all the time like you all have here. As a child, power outages were frustrating for me, not only because I didn't see, but, or not only because they put fear in me, but also because whatever I was doing, I had to wait for my mom to find the matches, which didn't look like this, by the way. I had to wait for my mom to find the matches for me to know where I was going and, and to know what I was doing. I felt stuck and helpless because I couldn't see anymore. Because I couldn't go anywhere. And I knew if I tried to go somewhere, there would be a high risk for me to stumble. Darkness is paralyzing. Darkness is scary. I don't know of any woman who is in the right mental and emotional state that would rather to be in darkness. The interesting point here is that John equates those who continually dwell in sin and hatred as people who continually are in darkness. In, the, in his gospel, John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, he says the following. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come unto the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. The worst thing about spiritual darkness is that it holds you back. It seduces humanity to remain in the bondage of sin. It lures you in deeper and deeper. It's an addiction that takes away all clarity that you have about you, about others, and about God. That's what sin does. That's what the kinds, this kinds of darkness that John is talking about does. We're living in some interesting times now. Even though we've got incredible technology... Even though we got communication and information here on our hands, I believe we are living in some kind of a dark ages renaissance. I really do. Think about it. We are more divided than we, we have ever been in decades. Sources that used to be truth now are questioned. People are calling virtually any news fake news. Injustices against minorities and people of colors continue to happen and even more so. Many on the other side of the debate are very afraid that what they value will be taken away. Disasters have come one after the other. And there's been a rise for nuclear extermination again. In fact, our Puerto Ricans brothers and sisters are literally in darkness. As they are waiting for the electricity to be restored. Most recently, what happened in Las Vegas? Talk about image of darkness. Yeah, we have been and we have seen some dark days recently. People are stumbling. There is less love. There's, uh, hope seems to grow dim. As a child, when I was in the dark, I will... I would wait for my mother to, to light a match. You know, and I, even though she was kind of a bit far away, you know, I, I, I was just waiting for that little 
light to pop up a little bit. Whoa, there's a little fire here. Here we go. So I would just wait for that and I would follow the light so I could find my mother. Perhaps I wouldn't be able to hold her tight because sometimes, you know, the, the match blew out the first time she stroked the first match. But I have a few seconds to know where I was going. I would run towards her and, and even if the match blew out, at least I knew I was closer to my mama. At least I knew that I have a few more steps to be where she was. At least I knew that darkness was about to pass. John says in verse 8, Yet I'm writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It's interesting that John didn't say, John didn't say that darkness has passed away. He knew we were living in difficult times. He knew that we were in difficult times. And, uh, and he didn't deny darkness was still active in this world. He knew that there were people who still desire to walk in darkness. He knew that there were people that were hiding their true selves in the shadows of religion and hypocrisy. Darkness was still present. As long as there is darkness in our hearts, there will be darkness in the world. As long as there is darkness in our hearts, love cannot be manifested. Even though darkness is apparent, light is here in the person of Jesus. Dissipating all darkness. Maybe it's just me thinking, but it's almost like John is saying what N.T. Wright will say. Already and not yet. John is saying, Jesus, the light is already shining. And the darkness is passing. And yet, it is to be destroyed completely. But it will happen. It will be destroyed. We have the hope in Jesus. And the Bible says, Amen. Yeah. Amen. John is clearly talking about Jesus, of whom he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness did not overcome it. In the incarnation, Jesus became the light for all to see. We were helpless, and he rescued us. We were once lost, and we are now found. We were once blind, but now we can see. We were once dead in our sins, and now we are made alive in Christ Jesus. Anybody say amen. Amen. My mom will light the lamp in that room. It looked just like this one. I kid you not. Just like this one. She will light it, and, uh, and then she will start turning that knob right here. Start turning the, the knob more and more. And all of a sudden, man, that room started to be illuminated. The light will fill the room. And I was able to come close to my mama and hug her. And, and I loved it not just because the darkness was passing away, but because I was able, I was able to see the face of my mother. I was able to hug her. And I was reminded how much she loved me and how much I loved her. You see, that's the reason, dear friends, that Jesus came to this world to illuminate us. 
He didn't come to this world to be the light so that we could understand the mysteries of his ways. It was not so that we could feel better about ourselves. It was so that we are able to see him face to face. It was so that we are able to see him clearly and understand how much he loves us and how much we ought to love him back. That is the purpose of the light. So you can see Jesus. Because he loves you and he wants to be in a deep loving relationship with each and every one of you. It is only when we are in the light and the resurrected Jesus is revealed that we are able to understand the commandment John is talking about. He's referring to Jesus' commandment to all of them in the last days of his ministry when he will have a very special moment with his disciples, which the brother read a little bit about. At this moment, John chapter 13 he washes his disciples' feet. He says to them, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By, a, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, John, John says uh, to love one another is an old commandment. <laughs> uh, not only because Jesus had preached it or because he had said it to his people, but it was indeed an old commandment because it was part of the Torah. The Word of God says in Leviticus, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So it was no commandment. And yet it was also new in the way that Jesus emphasized love. It was new that Jesus was saying that love was the summation of the prophets and the law. It's also a new commandment because Jesus makes it wider. He expands the spectrum uh, for which we ought to love. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus shows us that, that love is to be extended not only to friends and those who agree with us, but also uh, uh, for those who do not look like you, believe like you, love like you, and even those who don't like you. Jesus also made it new in a deeper way. He made it wider, and he also made it deeper. Jesus raised the standard when he said, you got to love one another as I have loved you. That's new. Well, which way? Washing people's feet. It's, it's just talking about laying your life for others, even those who don't like you and hate you, even those that may or may not betray you. The pulpit commentary puts us this way. The lie brought in by Christ points to love. And his love leads us onto the light. Following his light, we learn to love. Imitating his love, we are moving forward to the light. So here is the greater way that Jesus' commandment is new, my friends. It's new in the heart of his followers every day. Because if you are in the light, you will walk in the light. And your love for him and others will be renewed every day. When you love Jesus, your, lo your love and your life is renewed. And you don't have to love out of duty. You don't serve, we, we don't serve God and our fellow brothers and sisters simply because we are commanded to do it. We 
only love out of, if we only love out of duty, the commandment that Jesus gave us is indeed an old one. But when we love wholeheartedly, just like the woman who poured out that expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, or just like Jesus washing his disciples' feet, when we love wholeheartedly that way, then obedience is simply the evidence that the love of God is in us and that we abide in God's love. The true mark of a Christian is not knowledge. It's not miraculous signs. It's not a beautiful singing. It's not empty philanthropy. It's not hashtags. Saying, pray for Puerto Rico. It's not when you change your profile picture filter. The true sum of, of a Christian is love. What do I mean by love? When your chat becomes the act. When your preconceptions... When you go from preconceptions to conversations. When, 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 you, when you stop the tweets to watch the marginalized feet. When you complain less about the president and care more about your fellow resident. And I'm not talking about just those who have documents. Or whether they love different like you or look different like you, regardless of color or sexual preference or status. Again, the true sign of a Christian is love. There are many ways in which you can practice right loving, right here on this campus and right here in Joplin. For example, Water Gardens is a ministry in which you can serve homeless brothers and sisters here in Joplin. There are some of you that go there. Press your hand if, you, if you're part of that ministry. Anybody here in the house? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's an opportunity for you to practice right loving. Again, complain less about the president and care more about your fellow resident. There are so many other ways that you can serve. You may also drive about 20 minutes east from here and go to my church. We have a English as a Second Language ministry there. Where we teach English to our Hispanic community. We have a great opportunity to pour out our lives with those who are marginalized and to wash their feet. <coughs> Peter Schultz wrote a hymn that is also sown by jars of clay. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they know we are Christians by our love. Let it be so today for us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus, Father, we come before you in this very moment and we, and we, Lord, first recognize your greatness and how loving and amazing you are. We thank you for that. Your love has no bounds. We cannot comprehend how 
deep and how vast and how amazing is your love. But we do recognize our need for you. We recognize our, that we are poor in spirit and we, oh God, by ourselves, we cannot love as you have commanded us and the way that you want us to love. But we pray that your Holy Spirit will start cleansing our lives. That if there's any prejudice, if there's any hint of hatred within us, wash it away just like you wash the feet of the disciples. Cleanse us, O oh Lord. Purify us completely. Sanctify us, O oh God. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will renew our love so that we are able to live lives broken for a broken world and pour out for those who need love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.